Thank you for joining us this evening for the first program of our spring 2013 exhibition season and one that we are so honored to bring you this evening with Dr. Elizabeth Alexander and David Hart. Um, this is a really special moment for us both in honoring um, this exhibition and in looking at um, Stray Light uh, in its entirety, the thought processes and things that have inspired it, including Dr. Alexander's work, The Black Interior. Um, I also just want to say um, we do have several exhibitions on view right now. If you've not seen them, we hope that you will. Um, David Hart, obviously, Stray Light. Fred Wilson, Local Color. Gordon Park, The Harlem Family. Mendy and Keith Obadake, American Cipher, IAA Tom, Space Time Continuum, Assembly Required, Selections from the Permanent Collection, and Brothers and Sisters. So please do join us for other programs throughout the season related to these particular exhibitions. Thomas Lax, Assistant Curator, who worked on Stray Light and who helped present it here at the museum, will speak a little bit about the exhibition before we go on. So I think all of you who have seen David's work upstairs uh, can testify to his incredible skill as an artist. Um, working with him over the course of the last year, I've had the ability to also be able to testify to his um, skills as a thinker. Um, you know, those things obviously go together, but David's intense sensitivity to ideas and their life in the world is something that I've learned a lot from. Um, one idea that we've talked a lot about, um, or a set of ideas, emerged uh, from Dr. Uh, Alexander's work. And so it's exciting to be able to have this conversation that we've been engaging with virtually and textually happen in real time and real space. Um, I think all of those of us who were uh, here in 2009 um, celebrating the inauguration of Barack Obama got to witness um, the ways in which Dr. Alexander is able to bring words um, and ideas into the world. Um, I think those of us uh, looking back to her uh, six volumes of poetry and um, several books of um, criticism can speak to that as well. Um, many moments looking um, through the Black Male Catalog at Can You Be Black, B-L-A-C-K, capital, and look at this um, is deeply formative moment, I think, for a lot of us. So um, we're thrilled to be able to welcome these two thinkers um, to the stage and to have you all in conversation here together tonight. So thank you so much for being here. So it's great to be here with you. And um, uh, the way that we're going to do this, um, one of the things that's um, particular and nice about uh, this evening and this conversation is that we're beginning a conversation. Um, so we haven't met each other before. And many of the things, I've, I've read a whole lot um, about David's work and taken in these extraordinary images, but to be able to get a sense of the whole trajectory and why you do what you do, um, even as we think, 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 <laughs> will be um, a great part of the evening. Um, so um, I'm going to ask you some questions, and we're going to read a little bit, and we're going to look at pictures. Um, and so I wanted actually to start not even with biography, but with a very um, persistent um, thing that I've been thinking about as I've been living with your pictures. I've been thinking about um, the poetics of your work, moving all the way through to Stray Light, and thinking about the ways that I think most of your pictures do something that I would call stanzaic, actually. Um, I think that, that, that all of them sort of evacuate or carve out space in a way that feels akin to a thick, long-lined stanza. And that the ways in which you're consistently working with line, so literally, you know, visual line, but I think it makes a, a wonderful lead into thinking about poetic line, and again, the long line, um, is that you know, you've, you've got all this architecture that you're dealing with, lines that are supposed to be straight or at certain angles, and they are, but there's something about the way that you see and frame that sets them surprisingly askew. You know, it's like the box is turned in some kind of way, um, which I think is also a, a mark of success in the way that the line is used in through poetry. So um, I wondered about your relationship to poetry, well, what you think about that, but also about your own, um, if what poetry you like to read, or how you think about the arts in relationship to each other, poetry and photography. That's, that's very interesting, and I, I, I'm actually, um, 
perhaps we'll deal first with uh, the, the approach in the mm -hmm. way that you, you described the work having um, um, poetic aspects, um, and then um, um, you'll all be distracted enough that you won't remember the second part of the question. <laughs> 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 um, but um, it, it's really interesting um, because, yes, there definitely is, I think, um, uh, something at play, you know. Um, in the way that you described it, uh, in terms of how the image is composed, and I think that uh, the way that I the way that I tend to work is um, I do a lot of the, uh, the conceptual work, if you will, um, prior to ever kind of um, visiting a site. So uh, you know, I've 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 researched or I've selected a site because of you know something that I've come across either in the news or. Um, you know, through some of the texts that I've been reading. Um, and uh, I'm attracted to it, you know, in the case of, say, the, uh, the conservative free market think tank, the, um, the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. You know, what intrigued me um, with that organization was uh, that it was, uh, you know, the, the development of the, the Overton window, which is a policy tool for shifting, you know, radical policy to actionable policy. Or, um, you know, I heard a story on the news about uh, uh, the farm. It was on NPR, and they were interviewing um, the, uh, the teacher who ran the public school on the farm, which is a, a former commune, present-day cooperative in southern Tennessee. And uh, you know, I was deeply intrigued with you know this radio interview, and um, you know, he had 15 students in the school. Um, Who's you know were aged from K through eight, so you can imagine there was you know one or two students and some grades were completely absent. Um, but uh, what I'm getting at is there was a lot of kind of conceptual heavy lifting that was done before I ever encounter a site. But then when I actually visit the site, I completely forget. I try my best to forget you know what I know about it, and instead have a, a direct, you know, very I think conscious experience and really trying to lose myself in the act of photography, mm -hmm. right? So it's really about that encounter and the immediacy of experiencing the site for the first time. And that's where I feel, you know, that uh, there is a, an opportunity to kind of engage um, and, um, you know, uh, I think the poetic aspect kind of reveals itself through that encounter. Um, the, other, the other side of it is um, it's not, uh, implicit within the work itself, but explicit within um, the context that I create. So it's interesting that uh, you, you, you know, used uh, stanzas as kind of a frame of, frame of reference, um, and it's also the interplay, right, between each stanza and how it kind of corresponds to the preceding one and the, the one that, that, that comes afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what I try and do would give me an opportunity to exhibit the work is to uh, be very conscious of, of that context and how the work is seen in relationship to, to um, uh, the other pieces that are present. In the case of stray light, it's one site that's being explored. So how do I articulate the space um, you know, with each image? In which, because I do use um, documentary as a, as a methodology, I don't consider myself a documentarian. Um, so how do I you know, break I think within the mind of the, the viewer, the expectation that the site will reveal itself in documentary fashion, but instead allow for I think a more poetic interplay between the individual images. Um, and you know, I've uh, I've also shown multiple sites together, so it's the relationship and counterpoint that each site kind of suggests in relationship to um, uh, some of the other sites. Well, that's interesting about um, the documentary impulse because I feel like there's all of this narrative propulsion uh, that moves things forward, but with wonderful white space, if you will. Um, if, if we think about the, the space between stanzas, the spaces where you say, no, I'm not telling you every single fact of the story. That's not what I'm trying to do here. Um, and that, that also is very um, spare and contemplative, um, which, I, which is how I feel inside of the spaces. And also, I feel in the spaces uh, that, you, that, you, that you make. No, that's, that's a very, very, very fair assessment. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, part of photography is editing the world. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, um, 
Uh, but yeah, part of photography is editing the world and um, uh, the choices that one makes in terms of what to include and what not to include, mm -hmm. and uh, you know what uh, what maintains that kind of position in you know the center versus what gets pushed to the margin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, for me, the um, photographic plane, uh, I'm very much within the photographic plane. I'm very much interested uh, in the margin, you know, the edges. Um, and uh, it's something that also kind of expresses itself within the film as well. Um, there's one scene I really love, um, and it's on the um, one of the floors in the building. Um, it's uh, where the uh, fashion fair executives, fashion fair being the cosmetics and hair care products mm -hmm. line, um, uh, which is one of the divisions of uh, Johnson Publishing. And um, the uh, that specific image, one of the executives <coughs> is in. Uh, an office, um, you know, the door is open and you can hear him, or you can see him, rather, uh, talking on the phone. And then across the, the other complete margin of the frame, um, across this kind of expanse of, you know, generic office cubicles, is a single tube of red lipstick, mm -hmm. you know, just almost off the edge. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's, uh, for me, there's something really, you know, incredible. There's so much kind of potential and um, to explore, to understand the tension between these objects. And again, I think that that's a, a poetic conceit that, that I'm trying to explore. Mm -hmm. you, are there poets whose work you love? I've read in the interviews about um, some of the philosophers and theorists and um, people who interest you, but of poets? Poetry is difficult for me. Um, I mean, that, that's why I was, I was trying to uh, get out of this five <laughs> <laughs> But you are you are a poet. I mean, you know, well, poets are poets. Photographers are photographers. Painters are painters. But I mean, I think that there's just something profound that the work understands that that really does um, relate so much. And um, and I, I I was thinking too about the resistance of the celebratory. Um, you know, the kind of um, not cold eye, but cool cool eye, you know, and uh, that there's a way in which in these long lines of, you know, Walt Whitman, he's celebrating, he's saying, I am this, I am that, we are all, it is beautiful, but that's not what you're doing. Um, uh, and so I think that that resistance or cool is, is really interesting. That's great. Yeah, I think uh, kind of the concept of expressivity, you know, mm -hmm. I feel as though it runs at uh, different temperatures. Um, and uh, I, would, I, would, I think it's very fair to say that uh, you know the temperature with which I choose to be expressive is very cool. Um, and uh, so, in terms of references within you know the uh, or, or textual references within the work, uh, it tends to be much more analytical. Um, but it's it's got I mean it's something I I didn't bring to the table mm -hmm. right now. So I. I, I Hopefully, over the course of the uh, the conversation, we'll be able to pull it up from the, the memory banks and, and make it more. <laughs> or not, um, or <laughs> not, um, because I wanted to talk about some ideas first as a way of also thinking about how you came to be an artist and how you came to make um, to make your your work. I always find that a hard question, <laughs> but um, what's the story? Well, um, as uh, I mean, there's a number of. Uh, different uh, moments, I think you could say, that uh, allowed uh, me to think of myself as, a, as an artist. Thelma uh, uh, was, was really wonderful and, and I think uh, uh, was um, pressed me in, in exactly the right way to kind of uh, make me think and be conscious of, you know, what was that, that catalytic moment that, that allowed me to think of myself as, as a, a visual maker and uh, you know it, it definitely stems from um, you know moments that I enjoyed uh, early in my childhood. Um, uh, my mother uh, is an incredibly gifted amateur photographer and uh, from about the uh, age of eight um, years old um, I would uh, spend um, afternoons or late, early evenings, about uh, once a week in the dark room with her. And uh, her subject was always our family, and our home was decorated with just what I thought were absolutely beautiful black and white photographs of, uh, of myself, my brothers and sisters, um, 
and um, you know she would take pictures quite avidly of her over the week, and we'd go into the dark room and develop the film, and you know look at the contact sheets and then print them. And uh, um, for me, that was a really incredible you know exposure, you know, to um, you know, something beyond. I think, um, yeah, you know, it was that that that. That was definitely the moment in which I felt like, you know, this is something pretty cool that I think I can do and I can participate in. Um, it wasn't until much later, I mean, I participated in amateur camera clubs, you know, going through high school and uh, at CEGEP, I grew up in Quebec. So uh, we, we have, CEGEP is a continuation of high school before college. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it was something that I was always kind of involved with, but I always thought of myself as a, as a historian, so I was actually studying my, originally I was uh, um, uh, doing a, a Bachelor of Arts sort of a, a concentration in history, mm -hmm. and um, uh, realized, uh, you know, I think, I went into school just on a, you know, same kind of trajectory that everybody else does, you know, that's where you should be, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I realized that after, I was doing really, really poorly. <laughs> 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 that, uh, yeah, that I needed to take some time off, and I actually took a year off to kind of figure things out and uh, realize that what I always really wanted to do was to make pictures and uh, applied, reapplied to uh, the art program within the university and, uh, you know, was, was uh, allowed in. And uh, have a little bit of fact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I read in that interview you, you described the magic of watching the images come up uh, through the through the fluid, you know, watching it. And of course, that's not how pictures are made all the time now anymore. Um, what, what the technology changes? What, how does how does that affect itself? The technology changes, but your eye doesn't. I think that that's uh, uh, Thomas and I were actually walking through the uh, the Gordon Parks. Uh, uh, exhibit downstairs, and um, there's a really, really beautiful photograph of um, one of the uh, Fontenelle's, mm -hmm. one of the Fontenelle children uh, lying um, in, in a bed. And, um, uh, you know, first, the first thing I remarked on was, you know, how dark the images were, you know, and I, it was always an aesthetic that I attributed more to Roy de Carava than yes. Gordon Parks. Um, so it was really lovely to see images kind of printed, you know, in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I thought they were incredibly evocative and really kind of underscored, you know, the, um, uh, the point of, of the story. Um, but uh, this one photograph, um, I uh, was looking at it and I, re I realized that uh, it was kind of almost like a cloudiness or a, a spumato. Mm -hmm. um, uh, over the boy's face and um, torso area, and I realized that uh, the park's probably, you know, dodging and burning when, when, which is kind of like morphed into a Photoshop tool now. But, mm -hmm. but knowing kind of the technique and appreciating that, um, yeah, even though we are within, you know, an age in which digital, digital technology is not pervasive, I feel really privileged, kind of coming up and understanding, mm -hmm. you know, the role that uh, that light. You know, can play and, and, and the chemistry, and it, it really it really informs the way that I, I think and make pictures. Mm -hmm. um, even though the tools aren't the same, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's definitely a part of my DNA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and of course, also the space. I'm thinking about what uh, uh, once you've been in a dark room and once you've smelled that smell, and you know, mm -hmm. there, there is something imprinting about it. Yes. Um, if you could, because um, stray light um, is what I've thought the most about and what we have to see here, but I don't want to go there yet. I wonder if, because we have many of your pictures to understand the work on its trajectory, if you could take us through some of the earlier work. Sure, sure. I think, I think that might be the... Yeah, it starts with greening of De Detroit. I think the... Ah, good, here you go. Oh, this is the first. This is the first this one. Is, an, is not the green one. It's the inside one, the green house looking one. This one. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I lived in New York for about uh, after graduating. I'm not going to take us go into my whole biography. <laughs> Try to be really short about it. But uh, I think what's important to uh, to understand when looking at the images is that. Um, uh, after graduating uh, with my MFA from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, uh, I moved to New York with my, with my wife Catherine and uh, continued to practice for about two years. Um, and then, uh, you know, I like to say that life took over. 
um, and uh, I, I stopped making more uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, you know, I think that uh, at the core of it, I think that uh, you know, not that I ran out of ideas, but I definitely, um, uh, I don't think that I was mature enough in a lot of ways to really kind of think of myself properly as an artist, a professional artist. Um, I think that I had tremendous momentum, but you know, the steam ran, ran out. So I actually took a nine-year break uh, and didn't make any work for uh, approximately nine years. And um, uh, it was always something that I wanted to go back to, but it was something that I didn't want to do as a hobby. You know, it was something that I wanted to treat with the same degree of professionalism that I, that I wanted to do everything. Um, so I wanted to wait until a point in time where I felt as though I had something you know, clear to say, and I wanted to be able to develop what I felt was a sustainable practice. And that means a number of things, but I think at its core, it's um, a set of ideas that I think I could continue to explore, you know, for the rest of my life. Um, so I thought a lot about, you know, what it was that I wanted to do, um, and um, uh, what I ended up uh, developing was this, this kind of comprehensive list of uh, how I ended up with photography is another kind of thing altogether, but um, once I did kind of figure out the tools that I wanted to use, um, um, at, as a, I, what was the subject and what was my relationship going to be to the subject, and I developed this kind of comprehensive list of sites that I wanted to explore, and you know, ultimately what I wanted to do was um, to try and address you know, the full kind of range of the American experiment um, in terms of understanding an ideolo ideological spectrum, mm -hmm. right? So the, site, the sites that I had articulated were definitely kind of like, you know, nodes within this ideological spectrum. Um, and uh, we, uh, we were in New York for that entire period, and we uh, decided, we had our first time, we decided to, to leave the city. And uh, uh, we... I, we moved to Detroit for about three months, right there. <laughs> and uh, while, while there, I really kind of like said, all right, now it's the time to start making pictures. And um, one of the uh, communities uh, that I um, uh, got together with, again, through that kind of research, was uh, the Greening of Detroit, which is an organization that uh, has grants from the federal government uh, to um, address, I think, you know, the, the situation that's happening in Detroit in terms of, you know, uh, the, uh, um, the, the urban environment. So, you know, a city that was built to sustain, you know, a population of, what is it, three million people suddenly having, um, or not suddenly, over the course of several years, you know, now accommodating, I think, less than 800,000. Mm -hmm. um, what happens to the space and how do you, how do you re-envision a future, you know, within this kind of environment? And, Greenland Detroit was working really aggressively to kind of try and figure that out. So I contacted them and, um, you know, um, uh, asked them a lot of questions and uh, they helped point me in the right direction of a lot of uh, partner organizations that were starting to make a difference. So everything from, um, you know, organizations that were teaching environmental stewardship to, um, to children in public schools, to um, uh, Capuchin Brotherhood that was running a food bank, um, also um, a uh, beautiful urban farm in which they were growing produce that was um, being sold at the farmer's market, um, and uh, they even figured out a program in which um, uh, families could use food stamps to pay for uh, the organic, locally grown uh, produce. And that's actually a big deal mm -hmm. because there's this whole kind of certification process that has to happen as a result of that. Um, this image here is actually at the um, at uh, the, uh, the, the, the Capuchin Brotherhood, um, and um, this is this is one of the classrooms in which they taught environmental stewardship. So. Um, this is, this is actually one of the first images that I made, too. Mm -hmm. um, and then this one here was another organization. This was um, Dayhouse. And Dayhouse was an organization that provided shelter for um, uh, mothers and, um, and, and, and um, children from just looking to escape a domestic situation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what was interesting about this image here 
Um, and what I try and do is provide as much kind of contextual information as possible within the title. But there's always kind of nice kind of anecdotal stuff that happens around it. But um, this image here was photographed of the, they had a, a garden that was developed um, for you know, therapeutic reasons. And um, uh, a plot was, uh, was dug in this, this, this area. And then, uh, you know, they harvested one summer, and then the next summer, uh, their neighbor said, you can't plant them, that's actually our land. Um, but, um, you know, we'll help you, and we'll, you know, we'll move the, the garden over to your land, which is right over here. Um, and then the, the following summer, um, uh, this was the abandoned plot on the neighbor's property. But, you know, there was still some of the, the seeds that were present within the area. The neighbor's property is the MGM uh, casino. Oh, okay. So there's, a, I mean, there's obviously all these kind of ironic aspects to it. Is that a squash? Is that a yeah, 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 squash and chicory. Uh -huh. Yeah. Do you want me to keep going, or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll go much, I'll go much faster. Uh, this, uh, I, I'd already spoken of um, a farm, which is the intentional community or commune in southern Tennessee. Um, and I think you can see here, I think, just kind of like the, the, the breadth of, um, of kinds of images that can be made, you know, with, uh, in, in these different sites. And that's something that really excites me, you know, that, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm going there, I think, in a way, you know, just, you know again, I'm not aware of, of what a site's capacity is to yield something of visual interest. I'm interested mm -hmm. in the site conceptually, mm -hmm. um, so there's always this kind of tension uh, to, to make something that's in, engaging and interesting. Um, and uh, um, yeah, this image I'm actually really, really happy with. And mm -hmm. the, the way that I got to this was there was a light rain falling, and I just happened to go under the shelter you know, to wait till the rain kind of, and I was just kind of mesmerized and ended up spending, I think, about three hours just waiting for it. So I have so many pictures of hummingbirds at this feed. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure, I hope everybody's had the opportunity to um, you know, see the images upstairs. Um, these images are all scaled about 48 by 60, um, which was um, typical size for, yeah, a lot of the, uh, the earlier work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> This image um, is, uh, again, a uh, shot at the farm. This was uh, mushroom people, so uh, it being a cooperative, there are a number of, besides the school, there are a number of different businesses that operate uh, on the farm. And mushroom people, they make uh, spores uh, for sale uh, on the internet. Um, so this was... Um, uh, oh, no. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so uh, actually, the, the jar in the back is uh, the mushroom spores, and this is where they would, um, I'm not technical, so, but they would do things with chemistry and, mm -hmm. and mushroom spores yeah. <laughs> in the basement of the, of the facility. Yeah. And I, I mean, I love this. I mean, we were talking earlier about um, some of the, um, the kind of allusions that one can make to our historical moments. And um, you know, suddenly some, you know, something might present itself and uh, there's a way to kind of relate it to, you know, I think, you know, the arc of, I think, a certain type of visual history. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, this was this for me was a real kind of lovely exercise in trying to you know, address the, the genre of the, the Dutch seal life, you know. Yes. With the great title Inoculation Room at Mushroom People. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, uh, this is the school. So the uh, you know after getting in touch with them and uh, the professor there, um, one of the sites that I spent time at was the was the school. This is the music. Um, I had also mentioned uh, the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. So again, what attracted to me to them was uh, this policy tool that they developed. And um, I think you're starting to see kind of the range of possibilities mm -hmm. that I'm trying to, you know, set up within the broader practice. Mm -hmm. um, each site kind of represents, you know, um, its own node, but it also suggests a counterpoint further on yes. down the spectrum. Um, and uh, yeah, this, what's interesting, so I photographed uh, the Mackinac Center first, and uh, the counterpoint, if you will, was um, uh, a union headquarters in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's really interesting to kind of see, um, you know, how a site kind of reveals itself. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in is the, you know, um, kind of the conceptual territory and, and, and um, how, it's, how it manifests itself within the physical environment. 
here, I mean, it's almost, um, uh, and I, I don't mean this in any kind of derogatory way, although it sounds, sounds, sounds like, um, it's almost like a, it's, um, a cockroach of architecture in that it's ruthlessly efficient, right? Mm -hmm. the, the building itself can be used towards almost any, any ends, right? Uh, the work that could be done there. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's an interesting kind of counterpoint. Uh, and, and you could say the same thing about uh, the union headquarters. But what's an interesting counterpoint is Johnson Publishing, in which, you know, the concept, the ideological concept and the physical environment are so closely linked together, you know, and I think that there's, there's something really incredible about spaces that, you know, how spaces operate and how they match or, or, or reveal themselves in terms of the imagination. This is another photograph from the Mackinac Center. One of the things that's not visible here, um, uh, but it's actually visible in the photograph, um, like when you actually see it, I don't think we can get, yeah, because this is just not a great re reproduction, but very, very clearly printed on the stem of the, uh, of the flag, um, in all caps, is uh, Made in China. I, I, just, <laughs> I just love, you know, how, how sites kind of reveal themselves and the ironies that kind of emerge, and while, while taking this photograph uh, of uh, public relations uh, had um, Michael, Michael Jard, and his name was, uh, from the Mackinac Center, kind of you know, walk by. And when I shoot, I use a medium format digital camera, which is super high resolution, and I have it tethered to um, a laptop mm -hmm. so that I can actually you know, play with obviously color, but focus. So I use, uh, and especially with this early work, it was very kind of shallow depth of field, mm -hmm. which I kind of articulate as you know, a very kind of clear kind of focal plane mm -hmm. uh, to call specific attention to certain details. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know, he walked by and he said, oh, what are you looking at? And I said, oh, these flags. And he said, um, oh, yeah, they've been up since July 4th. I photographed this in January. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, and then I started, I started laughing to myself. And he said, what? And he walked over and looked, looked over my shoulder. And he's like, oh, isn't that, isn't that, isn't that great? When he saw the, the detail on, uh -huh. yeah, on the flag. So. When you talk about spaces revealing themselves, um, uh, what kind of time do you spend in these spaces? Spaces and what's it like? I mean, people are doing their jobs and going about their business, and you're doing your job in a different way. What's that like? Well, I don't photograph people, um, and it stems from a kind of a loosely held belief or, or, or theory um, uh, that uh, you know the way that I see photography versus, uh, say, film um, is that uh, for me, photography um, is a medium in which it uh, enables us to kind of capture. Uh, a sense of time that is so kind of foreign to, you know, our sensorium, or the way that we actually experience time. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it's a, so for me, photography is a, is a, is a, a, a tool best served, you know, towards uh, uh, still life and, and landscape. Uh, um, and, uh, <coughs> film is something in which I, I, I kind of consider portraiture. Mm -hmm. And um, even if there's not a subject present, because what it does, as you saw in the film upstairs, is even if there's not a subject present, right, uh, the building reveals itself mm -hmm. in the way that the building kind of breathes. So you have the HVAC kind of you know, articulating the space and moving the curtains. But that, that sense of time mm -hmm. um, is something that uh, it's, uh, it's one to one. It relates to, to, to our experience versus you know what I see here is kind of almost like a, a geological time kind of mm -hmm. being expressed, right? Mm -hmm. And so you were how long in there? That was actually the question, wasn't it? That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I won't forget. <laughs> um, each each site is uh, you know uh, this was actually I think two days, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, it really, it really varies. I mean, it depends on, you know, how complex the site is. Yeah. Um, um, you know, again, that kind of tension between, you know, um, a site revealing itself or not revealing itself, um, and then access, right? So, mm -hmm. um, usually what happens is, you know, most of, most of the time when I approach this, you know, a site, you know, they think, the first question they ask is why. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, why us? How did you find out? You know, what's your intent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, once I try and make myself understood, um, usually um, there's a degree with which they chaperone me mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the process, and then they realize that I'm, you know, gen generally harmless, and they just kind of let me go go about. 
Um, but uh, there's always that issue of access. They just can't have strangers kind of walking around, you know, on premise forever. Mm -hmm. So I have to be very kind of uh, focused. Mm -hmm. um, so the farm, I think I spent about a week there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm planning on going to, um, and this is exciting, you know, the, for uh, the next body of work I'm working on, uh, two sites, uh, one in um, uh, Sahelin, which is a, an island, you know, off the coast of uh, Siberia and Russia, mm -hmm. and the other is in um, uh, the Yukon, White Horse uh, in the Yukon. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, those are both cities. Or mm -hmm. one, one's an island, the other's a city. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to spend about a week in each. Um, so it's like, how do you find what you need to find in the given amount of time? Yes. Um, yeah, it's always, it's always a, something that's uh, in flux. Well, I think the question of access with stray light um, uh, is such an interesting one because um, the my first feeling about about the work, what I brought to seeing the work, was having lived in Chicago for many many years and hearing that you know it, it was this great black business icon, uh, the Johnson Publications Building, the ebony jet that you see from Lakeshore Drive, which I just thought you know. This is a Negro metropolis. You know, like, look at that. They say that they are with this building. Um, and hearing that there was this extraordinary African American art collection in the building, when I first got there, literally one of the first things I did was, you know, do, 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 do. Well, actually, then it was. Ch -ch 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 -ch. <laughs> and, and said, hi, da da da, can I come see your pictures? Um, and, but, you know, properly, oh no, can't get into the building. And I tried consistently for seven years to get into that building. University of Chicago letterhead, Professor Oliver the Ben. No. The, the concept, as you know, was that the, the art was for the people who worked in the building, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't for the public. Um, and so it was this sort of tantalizing, and I just wanted to go in. And talking with Aaron and talking with others, that's not an uncommon experience. So. Um, How'd you get in um, um, <laughs> is one thing, but I also know that this was at a very, very different point in the building's history. Um, you know, both Eunice and John Johnson uh, had passed at that point. Um, many things had changed. The building was about to be sold. Um, but I wanted to understand um, the process of, of, first of all, that you figured out that this was what you wanted to do, and then how you made your way into it. Sure. So I think, I mean, I think what's become evident is, you know, that uh, I'm trying to find different kind of nodal points, you know, within that broad kind of ideological <coughs> spectrum. And uh, uh, for me, you know, uh, I think it was after the work that I, I had done um, at either at both Rocky Glory and uh, <coughs> Map Reservations in, in Montana, uh, documenting um, uh, uh, different uh, Native American tribes, um, that uh, I started thinking about. Um, um, what what I might kind of find in terms of a um, uh, kind of a what's the word a singularity right kind of, kind of densely focused kind of expression of of a community mm -hmm. um, so how could I find something that represented that you know for uh, uh, the African American community right and for me you know it's just like glowing white hot. You know, mm -hmm. was was Johnson Publishing Company. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of my research kind of led me there mm -hmm. as as kind of like a perfect encapsulation of of, of trying to deal with and access, you know, that that, that experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then I tried for about two years, sent much the same manner as you did, from emails to letters. You know, um, I was granted one tour. A friend of mine, uh, Hamza Walker, curator, mm -hmm. um, he knew one of the editors there, and um, uh, she. Uh, it was very, very sweet and took me on a tour of the building, which just kind of made me even, you know, more adamant that I needed to get in there and, 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 and photograph. Um, but it was very, very funny because, I mean, she was very, obviously very respectful and very, you know, cautious, um, you know, and, and said, you know, I think I had a camera phone there. And she said, like, you can walk through. And she said, but you're not bringing any camera equipment, are you, or anything, mm -hmm. meaning like setting up. And I said, no, no. I said, I'll probably have a you know, camera phone. And she said, OK, that's fine. And so I snapped a few, a few pictures of it that way, just as kind of like mental notes. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think that was about maybe the first kind of like, I think it was about two years that I tried <coughs> at that point uh, to get in and uh, just had the same. It's a very, very, you know, um, very insular, very private organization, mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
uh, it was at a dinner with um, uh, the Michael Darling, the curator who actually um, uh, I worked with originally uh, when this exhibition was uh, uh, shown at the uh, Museum of Contemporary Arts. It was actually a commission from Michael. Um, uh, he invited me to a dinner at um, one of his board members' houses, uh, Jack Guthman, and Jack and Sandy Guthman. And uh, uh, we had just started talking about the possibility of making a work, and uh, nothing was agreed upon. It was really just kind of still up in the air. Uh, Michael knew about my desire to, to work with the site. He also knew how important the site was with uh, you know, the history of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, he mentioned it to Jack, and uh, Jack said, you know, and I expressed you know, my frustration. And Jack said, well, you're just not talking to the right people. <laughs> and uh, I said, clearly. <laughs> and uh, he made, uh, I mean, you know, and you hear things all the time, and all of us have, you know, it's like, yeah, no, I know, I know so and so, and uh, you're sure you'll never hear about this again. But uh, a month later, I got a phone call from Jack, um, and he said, you're in, this is who you need to talk wow. to. And uh, it was incredibly easy afterwards. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we picked a time and showed up. I spent about uh, two weeks on and off um, uh, shooting both the, the film and the photographs. Um, I used different setups for both, so I didn't, I didn't uh, do both at the same time or the same days. I would go in with the objective by the shooting photographs or shooting the film mm -hmm. um, on alternating days. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, once, once. Uh, uh, you know, um, Jack uh, had made the introduction, I think, you know, and I obviously had stated what my objectives were. Um, and this was completely, I mean, I had no idea that the, uh, the business, uh, uh, that the building was being sold. Mm -hmm. So that was, it wasn't, in fact, it was announced the day that I started shooting. Oh, my goodness. So I had no idea mm -hmm. that, that, that that was actually going to happen. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, it was incredibly simple once I was there, and um, they were such a fantastic organization to work with. Um, so incredibly trusting, um, and I was uh, really delighted and felt very privileged to be able to engage with the site. And I wonder if, um, I mean, the, the idea of the archive itself and the idea of the archive, I think, pulses all the way through the work, especially powerfully in, um, well, there's a picture called the archive, but also um, in, in the film. And I wonder if uh, someone in the organization thought that that was something that they were going to get from this, a kind of documentation. Uh, not necessarily a swan song, but you know, knowing that things were about to change. And there's this incredible sense that you capture of incipient uh, change. Uh, and I was um, really interested in the film. There's a moment where you linger on the clock. And at first, you think, time stands still. Yeah. But like, do, yeah. do, 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 do. Yeah, so. it's just moving a little bit, but it is moving. Yes. Um, and we talked about also the timeline in the archive um, photograph. Well, well I, I, I saw it as a timeline. Um, uh, there's the clock, and then there's the African sculpture, and then there's the long top of the uh, partition, I guess. Yes. yes. Um, That's um, actually the files behind it. There, okay, it's the, there we it's, go. The, it's the photography archive. Okay. So the, uh, there are negatives and, and prints in those drawers on the other side. So I mean, I felt like, you know, a, a way that someone in the organization could think about this picture um, would be, first of all, that it's documented something that's gone. I mean, there's that. Um, but also the, the black idea of Ebony, Jet, and Johnson publications, African origins, but then the timeline that goes off into who knows where, yes. um, into the future, because there is something very, very futurist yes. about um, Johnson publications at all times. Yes. They're always looking forward. Yes. Um, so um, that's just so interesting that the very day you started was the day that it began to become something else. Yes, no, absolutely. I think, I mean, Thelma, I, I know could probably speak more astutely to this, this idea of, of, of to what degree your organization was conscious of its legacy and um, because I, I believe that you had spoken with Linda specifically regarding that, but it was something that I was I was uh, completely unaware of. You know, it was some, I came in, and you know, uh, my intent was never to document the site. Mm -hmm. um, my intent was to make a make a work. Um, it, what's interesting, uh, there's always this tension, uh, and I think here it's more most explicit uh, between you know uh, one's intent for the work and how the work kind of 
is contextualized within culture. Mm -hmm. And here, I think it's serving kind of very, very much dual purposes. But yes. I mean, Thelma, did you want to uh, address or address to what degree you thought Linda might have been conscious of the idea? Well, I think that what was clear is that it was this sort of wonderful moment of time, not necessarily to document the building, but for you to be able to see it to see it now, to see it at this point in its history, and to have this project stand as part of the history. When the building was open, it was documented in the magazine, in this fantastic spread, which talks about the architecture, the design, the decor, which you see mm -hmm. here. But I think, really, you were sort of intervening into this moment to really <coughs> begin to think about it again, because the building, while sold, is going to have a life attached to Columbia College. Mm -hmm. um, in Chicago, and so we'll continue to live and be a space that people will interact with, and I think some of it might remain in some ways, um, in ways that you'll still be able to see, but you were sort of like the inflection point of this past and present. I think that's a good, yeah, that's, that's fantastic insight. Um, and yes, I, it, I don't know why I didn't recall it, but yeah, the building was and <coughs> documented. Yes. Um, uh, in 71 to 71, 1971 issue of Ebony Magazine, and it's maybe a 30 page spread wow. in which they go through, um, they go through the entire building from, you know, the photo studio on the ground floor and the lobby all the way up to, uh, to John Johnson's offices on the top floor, and um, what's interesting is um, that, uh, I mean, it's all, it's, it's people at work, yes. you know, and it's, uh, it's, um, it's really beautiful, um, you know, the cafeteria is full, um, it's, uh, yeah, and I think, I like, I like what you said about, you know, it's, um, the distance traveled between, you know, that, 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 perfect moment, mm -hmm. you know, when the building revealed itself or presented itself to the world and uh, the opportunity I had when, you know, uh, the building um, uh, was shed mm -hmm. so that the organization could go on and become what it is now. And, and you, you talked about what it meant to come to this as, I don't think your phrase was an outsider, um, but the comparison I'll make, um, and we had said we'd read a little bit, I'm so happy that this, like this book. Uh -huh. um, uh, so, I mean, the way I come to this space and the whole idea of it is coming from a Negro metropolis, coming from Eddie and John on the coffee table, coming from um, uh, you know being steeped in what this co because of course you know the paradox of the privacy of the building is that they were so public with the magazine. I mean, the spread across a real thing called Black America in all of its multiplicity um, is you know, almost measurable. Yes. Um, and you're coming from a different geographical place, um, a different, do you want to talk about that a little bit? About um, what it means? I mean, I, I think in a way, there's something fantastic about coming without all the associations. Right. Um, I think in some ways, I wonder if um, someone who grew up in uh, Ebony Jet World, writ large, um, would feel the need to be ironic, or you know, look at things ironically, um, uh, and in a way, you're just looking. Yeah, that's actually that's great, and um, uh, maybe not ironic, but I think there's this, this, this almost this. Um, there's also, I think, uh, maybe a later desire to memorialize the space, um, and that was something that I didn't necessarily have the burden of kind of representing, um, but uh, you know outsider or whatever, um, the, the key is is that I didn't grow up with it as part of my, my cultural heritage. I haven't grown up in Montreal with, mm -hmm. you know, you know, white Jewish parents. It just wasn't something that I was exposed to. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, so for me, you know, it, it, in terms of all of the sites that I, that I choose to explore, there's a desire to kind of heuristically, you know, experience and understand the potentials of those sites. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, um, this was an opportunity to really kind of immerse myself in a specific type of cultural identity. Um, and one of the, um, uh, again, Hamza Walker, one of my uh, confidants, um, you know, while researching it, he recommended um, uh, you know, your book. And um, it was um, you know, specifically that essay, The World According to Jet, mm -hmm. that um, made such an incredible influence. And for me, it was such a, a wonderful kind of uh, uh, grounding or orienting point. Uh, specifically in the way that uh, that concept of black interiors started to 
uh, be understood. And it was almost like a, there's almost a Victorian kind of quality to it. And what I loved about that is, is kind of the stark contrast that, um, that uh, the Johnsons chose to pursue, you know, in terms of how they wanted to construct the identity of, you know, of, of uh, the organization. Well, and that, that also, I mean, you know, I talked about irony, but then also there is um, uh, not sentiment, but feeling. You know, you talked about how um, you, the part that moved me in the film, that actually moved me to tears in the film, was when you end with the archive and those rows and rows and shelves, ebony, hue, sepia, jet. I, I was in the midst of teaching, I am in the midst of teaching a class on archiving African American poetry. And as I was looking at those pictures, my students were writing me emails saying, I can't find copies of the journal of black poetry. I can't find copies of eyeball. I can't find copies of all of these important cultural artifacts of black people that they have not been able to keep. So the relentless self-narrating of the Johnsons is actually, it's, it's, it's a much larger project. So to see, they kept this stuff. Yes, yes. And they kept it, even if they didn't let us in to see it, they still, they still kept it. Yeah. Um, and in being able to see this picture, which I love so very much, um, up close and seeing like in that picture, Lyndon Johnson is holding Jet Magazine. Yes. That, Linda, that, in that picture, well, it's up in the gallery. Lyndon Johnson is holding, as we always put an article for it, the jet. Um, <laughs> is how we refer to <laughs> Jet Magazine, the jet. Um, and uh, uh, so it's just something that, that would be lost if someone hadn't held it dear. And that these were black people who made a whole lot of money um, and proudly displayed that um, uh, and were about that. Um, but also had a cultural caretaking piece to them, which I find, as someone who works with this stuff, uh, to be very moving. Um, I think, uh, so I want to give you the opportunity yes. to read, but um, uh, the, uh, the point you made about um, when, uh, or, or rather that, uh, that, that legacy component, mm -hmm. like the archive, um, very deliberately I pushed that to the end of the film. What I wanted, mm -hmm. what I wanted people to kind of see and experience uh, before they kind of realized, you know, um, the nature of the organization was how it, it uh, stood in terms of um, what I felt was, you know, um, a, a really incredible contribution to the concept of modernity, but it was something that hadn't necessarily been documented or uh, accommodated within that, that, that narrative. So, you know, how to extend that concept of modernity first and mm -hmm. foremost, mm -hmm. and then afterwards, you know, um, uh, the legacy component was kind of brought in. But I felt that that also allowed me to think a little bit of, of distance and criticality um, so that I didn't, um, uh, it wasn't, like it was under sentiment kind of yes. expressed at the beginning instead of kind of revealed itself, its nature, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, towards the end, and it, it does have. I mean, for me as well. I mean, I see it. Uh, I've seen it a lot. <laughs> um, I still have, um, you know. I think uh, there's a very kind of emotional uh, experience, you know, with mm -hmm. that end. I think it's very effective. Mm -hmm. But I love the way that it kind of starts off in this kind of like almost kind of cool analytical way, mm -hmm. and it, it moves through all of these kind of temperatures and expressions. Yes. Yeah, yes. So I, I'm sorry. You should. Definitely no, no. Well, let me. Yeah, I'll read a little bit, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, uh, there, I'm sure, are questions. So this is um, a bit from The World According to Jet, Notes Toward a Notion of Race Pride. Uh, and uh, it talks about a little bit about, you know, why, uh, there's something touching to me about the way in which Jet has been the caretaker of the curious tales of black life. Where else would you read about the Siamese twins, uh, these black conjoined Siamese twins, big Jet story? Um, Jet was where I followed the story of uh, Joanne Little, the black woman in prison who stabbed her white guard to death with an ice pick when he tried to rape her. And Jet is where maligned black America has often pled its case. Frank Willis, the black guard who discovered the telltale tape on the door of the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Watergate and began the chain of events that brought down a corrupt presidency, was found by Jet to be unemployed, living with his mother, and accused of stealing a $12 pair of sneakers. In a Jet exclusive, he said it was a total mix-up, which is all the magazine's prototypical readership would need to know, since black is always right in Jet. Why would anyone want to know these stories anymore, you might ask? But in this young millennium, there is still something potent about a magazine that says, your life is important because it is black. 
you exist in the way that some black turn-of-the-century anthologies biz busily chronicle the noteworthy doings of black undertakers, dentists, and the like. In some ways, Jet is more populist, even as it unabashedly se celebrates material gain and self-promotes the Johnson family as a prototype for its patriarchal vision of the black American family following the benevolent dad to the promised land. John Johnson is in many ways a modern day Booker T. Washington, which you're filming at the bookshelves, uh, at lots of Booker T. Washington on the shelves. And Washingtonian judgments about black uplift permeate the pages. What does this particular variety of race thinking mean today? Are the fates of black people intertwined in a way that speaks for the need for a magazine that purports to speak to an entire black nation? There is something romantic and appealing about the ideas that black people are somehow discernibly connected across country and diaspora. But common sense says otherwise. Indeed, the monolithic phrase, the black community, has rightly come to seem imprecise. There have always been class differences among black people, differences, differences of aim, aspiration, and opportunity. How then to work with the romantic impulse for community, for racial collectivity, while at the same time bringing an open-eyed understanding of these differences to such racialist imaginings? And when the Johnsonian model of race pride puts the all-knowing father at the head of the family, what do we do with race when everyone involved is black, when it's Clarence versus Anita or Desiree versus Mike? I want to trash the centerfold and hold on to Joanne Little claim the importance of visibility and extend that in Jet's pages to other strong, unruly women, gays, and lesbians. In 1955, when 14-year-old Emmett Till was lynched in Money, Mississippi, Jet published the photographs of his bloated, ruined body that would burn itself into the minds of black America and the world. Jet told the story Americans needed to know. We are past the legal gains of the civil rights era, but we still haven't overcome and are not even sure we're a we. My problems with Jet are myriad, but I'm still a reader. With each instance in which the violation of a black person is made public in its pages, I am able to think about whether it is violence or its ever-present possibility that unites us as black people. And I still revel in straight-up celebration of black glory. However tacky, however ephemeral these photos of black celebrities outside of Ebony Jet headquarters may be, I still hold on to them as an idea that this thing called black culture and these people called black people can both be productively, complexly understood as nuanced entities whose acts and practices we hold to the challenge of criticism. So that's, you know, kind of how I thought about that. I was thinking I haven't looked back at that in a long time. And uh, in the magazine, it was always Ebony Jet headquarters. You know, I mean, there was the idea not just that the magazine was being made there, but that sort of the race was being run out of it. <laughs> you know, um, uh, and then, you know, just to finish, perhaps it was, um, uh, just, um, to finish with um, uh, one concept uh, here that um, uh, the black interior, um, because I think it's kind of interesting to put Jet first and then that concept second, what unites these essays uh, as is an idea, a metaphor of what I call the black interior, that is, black life and creativity behind the public face of stereotype and limited imagination. The black interior is a metaphysical space beyond the black public every day toward power and wild imagination that black people ourselves know we possess but need to be reminded of. It is a space that black people ourselves have policed at various historical moments. Tapping into this black imaginary helps us envision what we are not meant to envision. Complex black cells, real and enactable black power, rampant and unfetishized black beauty. What do we learn when we pause at sites of contradiction where black creativity complicates and resists what blackness is supposed to be? What is it in our culture that speaks, sustains, and survives post-nationalism, post-racial romance into the unwritten black future we must imagine? Um, and so, there you go. That's great. That's great. I love that one. Um, so, I think we should see what others want to ask you. Or us. Or ask us. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, others. In your photograph. How are you? Good, good, thank you. Uh, in your photograph, you want to use basically yeah, the area of light. Do you mind asking that? No, no, it's okay. Just for the rest of the audience. <laughs> now, I was asking uh, in, your, in your photograph, you, you 
sometimes beyond any kind of the place that you're photographing. You never bring any kind of. No, it's strictly it's strictly ambient light. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that's why you find the light, the colors, everything is. Uh, yes. Integrated yeah. at the beginning. Absolutely. In fact, um, I. Uh, for the most part, I don't. I don't even touch the the scene itself. Okay. So it's it's really about trying to find you know. Dangerous. Exactly. Exactly. Find a vision. Uh, yes, I think um, um, the the concept of uh, uh, point of view for me is is something that's very critical. I think of photography as a, a somatic device, right, in which it allows you to literally probe the universe. It uh, has a relate. You have a. I want there to be expressed my relationship to the environment through right. the photographs. Right. That inspires you. Yeah. I was fascinated yesterday when I, when I saw your, uh, the, the, the movie about the music and about the inspiration and about the music. Where did it came from? So, um, uh, the music is actually, um, it was a, a score that I commissioned, uh, Nicole Mitchell was the composer. Oh, um, she worked from a rough cut of the film. Um, we uh, uh, went into the studio with the rough cut. She, we worked with uh, seven musicians. Um, she, uh, she plays flute, as well as being a fantastic composer. But I think um, in there was an addition, there was drums, there was vibraphones, bass, cello, saxophone, um, et cetera. Uh, but um, the way I came about it, it's actually uh, kind of funny. Uh, the scratch track that I initially had in the film uh, while editing was um, uh, um, Wim Mertens. Wim Mertens? Wim Mertens is a, um, a Belgian composer. Uh, kind of systems music, very much like Steve Reich or um, Philip Glass. Uh, so you could just imagine kind of very regimented, you know, very cold. Um, and I played uh, a rough cut of the film for I've mentioned him about seven times, I think, today, Hamza, <laughs> Hamza Walker. Um, and uh, he, he was just like, oh, no, no. He said, the, the, the music is, 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 is fighting the film. He said, they're doing two different things. And, um, and uh, really what I was looking for was, was as much you know, something that, um, that uh, set, a, you know, it, for me it's a propulsive device. Right, it, 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 it kind of drives the narrative um, in a in a way that um, it isn't present because there's no dialogue in the film, there's no plot per se. So for me, music kind of provides that component that moves the narrative forward to some degree. Um, but it was just doing it too literally, and uh, but what I did appreciate the instrumentation, and he recommended several musicians and. Uh, uh, the next day, I went to the jazz record market and bought you know, all of their CDs, and etc. And uh, Nicole's music just kind of really stood out. And um, uh, through him, it, it stood out for a number of reasons: her sensitivities as a composer, uh, the instrumentation again. But then there was something that was really critical, and it made it made it all make sense: was that she was actually the first uh, female president of the AACM, um, which was an organization that I feel was, was probably at their prime. Mm -hmm. uh, around the same time as uh, Johnson Publishing, you know, open to the public. So there was this great kind of conceptual connection between, you know, her, her relationship to the organization, um, and, and what was going on and being expressed visually, so perfect. Yeah. But the editing was done before the music was... Correct. So you did, the whole music was set up after. <coughs> Correct. Yeah, she actually scored to, to the end. Looking. Yes, and you can really see that. I mean, there's this wonderful scene where the, uh, the Venetian blinds are kind of moving back and forth, and she has that wonderful passage. And then just the way that she kind of played with like, the, the tension and release of, um, of um, you know, I love, one of my favorite scenes is the, um, the test kitchen with that riot mm -hmm. of, uh, of um, you know, pattern of the, the wallpaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's an incredibly still scene, but uh, the music is just, it's, yeah. it's absolutely a crescendo. And she brings that out, you know, she brings that vibe and, and exuberance out. Hi, I, uh, I just moved here from Chicago uh, not yet a year ago, and I had the opportunity, I feel guilty about it now, Mm -hmm. uh, to um, go in the building several times because Pam Cash Menzies, who was a librarian there for many years, um, I think she started her for maybe over 30 years, 
uh, was a colleague of mine. And one thing that I think that you said that I wanted to hear more about was the idea that Mr. Johnson created this building and in all of its opulence and over the topness for the employees. And I think, you know, when you think about that kitchen, the, the staff kitchen, you know, the staff area where the staff eats, he even went so far as to um, hire really great chefs so that the staff paid a dollar every day and they had this amazing food. And I would eat there sometimes on Fridays, which was red beans and rice and cornbread and catfish day. <laughs> but I think um, when, I, when I think about this, and I haven't, I haven't gone up yet and haven't had the opportunity uh, to see the larger work, I can't wait to see it. But the thing that I think about is the contrast with so many employees who worked at um, Ebony and Jet, who lived on the south side of Chicago, and some not in Hyde Park, but in parts that you know even today we begin to you know we think about um, when we think about you know <coughs> urban blight in you know in Chicago. I think about the testimony of what the project was, what he was trying to do, and what he was trying to say um, about you know, black life and about work and the value of your work and your labor. And I know that you didn't, you know, you're saying that you, you, you know, you don't really concentrate on the people, but I think you've captured that energy in some of the photographs I've seen. And I just want to, you know, so there's so much history there. And as someone who's the spectator, I just want you, maybe if you can just talk about that, because that's what's so meaningful for me and what I'm seeing. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, really how to address it, uh, except that uh, yeah, I think it'll also be interesting once you actually see the film too to see the the role that uh, you know the the figure plays you know in terms of in terms of the environment and uh, uh, hopefully it uh, provides another dimension in terms of understanding. I mean, I don't think I don't think that uh, the there's a nice relationship between the film and the photographs. I think they successfully say very, very different things. Um, you know, I think that um, there's a lot that's present within the photographs. Um, I think of them as kind of you know uh, vehicles that try and encapsulate that that ideological potential, um, and I think that. Uh, the humanity that you're referring to is something that, so for me these are conceptual vessels, whereas the humanity, that kind of, again, the concept of kind of addressing the sensorial or our lived experience um, is something that I think the film starts to address. Um, I'm not sure if that, if that kind of addresses the question, but I feel as though, you know, they're, they operate on two kind of different planes. What, 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 what? Um. Well, you know, they, I think right from the opening of the film, um, where there's the lobby and the red sofa, and it, it is so quiet and it is so still that to me it feels like all of the accrued years of those people and that history and that legacy that, that something is winding down. It's um, in, in the photograph that has the, the gold embossed um, emblem, it's just a little bit healing, you know? Um, uh, just that sense of and, and, you know, and so, I mean, one thing you could do with it is in, in thinking about all of these black people and also, again, this idea of blackness that will need to become something new yes. in the way that time moves on and people change. They don't necessarily get better or worse, they just evolve. Um, so, you know, that movement um, is something that, that I think is at work that ties together what you were saying. Yes, um, I read that uh, Van der Zee wasn't such a great photographer, but so many of his photographs survived that he became known as a good photographer. Did he, did he, did he, did he, did he, <laughs> you can take out Van der Zee. I mean, I'm not sure how to address that. I mean, I, I do think that it's um, that it's uh, it's interesting, you know, um, as a visual artist, um, you know, one of the the way with which I, I I like to kind of address the 
success of my own work, and I think one of the tools that I use in terms of understanding others' work is uh, there are three kinds of criteria. You know, it's, um, somebody accused me of being an incredible modernist after telling them this recently, so I don't know if you guys you can tell me if it's true or not. Mm -hmm. But um, it's um, you know, how does a uh, how does a work kind of satisfy you know the formal properties you know of its you know of itself? So a photograph, you know, how does a photograph kind of solve its own kind of formal property, uh, formal issues? Um, or painting, or a piece of sculpture. Uh, secondarily, um, how does it um, how does it uh, address the history of the medium, right? How does it how does it how is it conscious or self conscious of, of itself in relationship to all that came before that concept of precedence? Um, and then thirdly, um, how does it um, uh, address its own time, right? How does it address the history of, of, of the moment that within which it was made? Um, and, uh, you know, what, what I think is incredible about showing the work in this institution um, is the opportunity to see the work, you know, in relationship to, you know, amazing photographs, you know, by, by Gordon Parks, you know. Uh, Thomas and I were walking around and I think, you know, there, there are so many kind of points of connection, you know, with, within which what I'm trying to do. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it in an incredibly new light, you know, as, as, uh, as it relates to, you know, this institution and the works on display here. So I think it's a roundabout way of, uh, <laughs> you know, addressing, I think, all of our kind of individual contributions to, to, to the broader practice. I think also it's interesting with, with Stray Light, and you talked about how you, you're not photographing people. Um, and of course, Van Der Zee, I was sort of going through to think, does Van, has Van Der Zee ever not photographed people? I mean, there's always people. It's always about people in a certain way. Um, and it's not about, in his work, the space so much. I mean, often there's that Fantasia studio space that he uses that you know, could be uh, anywhere. Um, but um, the ways that the pictures are about Harlem and black people in time and space, um, even if we're not always situated in that space, um, I think just shows also two very, very, very different uh, formal approaches um, to, at the same time, making work that has its historicity. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's great. Thank you both. I was wondering if you could um, maybe both talk a bit about, not so much the aesthetic part of black interiors, but a kind of um, black interiority, the kind of complex, jagged terrain of black existential life. And so, can we talk about that a little bit? This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I could, could read from the book where I already thought about it. And, and okay. I, I, that's such a beautiful, big, broad question. I almost don't know where to enter. Actually, I would ask you to say some more about what you mean and think. I guess what I'm thinking about is what you read some, some more about the kind of tension between race, race pride, right? Mm -hmm. And the kind of you know, ongoing contradictions about black life, you know, the kind of the impulse to post racial um, in this person moment, but also the, the collecting, the archiving that you find so fascinating about, about Ebony and Jet. Mm -hmm. But more than that, like how it might, you know, the kind of capitalist project, the empire building project of Johnson, right? How does that relate to the kind of dispossession on South Side Chicago, for instance? So, like, what's the contradiction between a kind of you know rabid capitalism, which you mentioned before, maybe not in those terms, and also a kind of dispossession that's going on among Black people at the same time? So, oh, I'm glad I asked black, you because that's a whole other thing. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, so for me, they're related in the sense of I'm trying to figure out. I'm thinking, you know, of you know, just because it's Chicago of. Need a son, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, how is that building, for instance? It wasn't built then, but yeah. or Chicago today with all the killing, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So, I'm um, I'm just thinking when they saw black interiors and the wonderful imagery on the cover of your book, I thought interiority right away, mm -hmm. and the kind of interiors talks about multiplicity, mm -hmm. right? That you were refusing to model mm -hmm. So it, it just drove me inside to an existential place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, what, and also echo what you said at the very beginning about how you're made to feel in the space, the environment that um, David Hart provided you. So mm -hmm, that's what I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that also, um, it, it's a big question, but. Yeah, I, 
Yeah, um, well, it, it makes me want to talk more about Chicago, actually, um, and about um, Gwendolyn Brooks's poetry, um, which is so important in so many ways um, and is so in need of kind of constant uh, examining, right? Um, and the way in which, you know, her, her poem set in the iconic kitchenette apartments of Chicago, those spaces, that she's saying, let's go inside in this place and see how these people, in the midst of privation, in the midst of struggle, um, how these people are, are thinking and dreaming and negotiating and managing uh, and making their way. And I think there's no finer exemplar um, of that tension and that struggle and the insistence um, that somehow an interior life, um, uh, even if it's only, you know, a great poem of Brooks's that I really love to quote is her um, uh, um, kitchenette, uh, a kitchenette apartment. You know this poem? Um, so do you know how it starts? Uh, we are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan, grayed in and gray. Dream makes a giddy sound, not strong, like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying man. But could a dream rise up through onion fumes and fight its white and violet with fried potatoes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the hall? We wonder, but not well, not for a minute, since number five is out of the bathroom now, we think of lukewarm water. Hope to get in it. Mm. So, you know, that's, uh, you, you, you keep these things at hand because they just do what needs to be done better than any other answer could. So, um, Gwendolyn Brooks is always the right answer. <laughs> fascinating question and what I think about the black interior the book is that and even the poem you uh, you just recited is that and it connects to how I experienced the exhibition as well is that it's not so much about the existential individualized interiority but an interiority that sets the conditions for the inner life that we're not talking about the personal in a way but the social constitution of the personal mm -hmm. the things that make the personal able to be known and talked about rather than individualized and mm -hmm. that's that's what i got out of the exhibition and the book black interiority and the poem. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Does that yeah, make sense? And I think, yes, um, and I think uh, also, I mean, I don't need to tell you this uh, about Chicago history, but what I think is, is so interesting about, um, and why exactly Chicago has become a site for these convergences is a really interesting mm -hmm. question. Um, but, you know, all of the sociological literature, mm -hmm. thinking about the Negro, uh, uh, it, that, that comes out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, um, the ways in which the art uh, finds its way um, to give you something that that sociology never could. Mm -hmm. um, and that that sociology sometimes flattens even in its quest to understand. You know, sometimes it's trying to pathologize, but sometimes it's yeah. trying to enlighten. Mm -hmm. um, and there's all of that happening. Even the score did, the, uh, the musical score does that. Uh, it's because of the language that she wrote it in, that it's, it's basically non-diatonic, it's non-isometric, it denies the listener all of these uh, things that we're used to grounding our subjectivity in, in, in Western music. So and she's pushing out in these, it, these experimental ways. So it's really, really the music is perfectly matched as well with this whole conversation. Mm -hmm. I, it's funny, um, as, 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 as we were talking, you guys were speaking, um, um, but I realized, I mean, and again, I think it's a factor of me, you know, really kind of experiencing um, a lot of these, these ideas mm -hmm. uh, for the first time. Um, but there is a degree of intuition, and I think you know, looking at my practice from the surface, I don't think that it's that, that it's apparent how intuitive mm -hmm. um, or how intuition you know plays, I think, such a vital role within within the work. But um, one of the aspects, you know, when we're talking about interiority and exteriority, 
that, that plays itself out uh, quite explicitly in the work is that uh, the entire narrative, and in fact all the photographs as well, um, unfolds uh, exclusively on the interior. Yeah. In fact, the only exterior <coughs> representation of Johnson Publishing is what I refer to as the establishing shot, mm -hmm. which is the facade of the building. Mm -hmm. So this actually represents the facade of the building. It's a very simple post and lintel 11 story construction with a glass curtain wall. Mm -hmm. And what I've done is I've abstracted the elements. Mm -hmm. And it's quite purposeful that, um, that one sees it through the doorway as, as you enter the room before you see the film. So you're actually presented with that facade, that concept of exteriority, mm -hmm. before you actually enter into the space. And then the rest of the story kind of unfolds from that, that sense of interiority. And again, that, I mean, there was no kind of conscious, you know, yeah. as, it, that was completely kind of intuitive to try and, you know, that didn't, didn't really actually connect the two mm -hmm. until, mm -hmm. you know, this discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where can we find the film? <laughs> the, the, the film right now is up, is upstairs. Yes. Yes. Um, are, you, are you talking about uh, beyond that? Like a, like a video or something? Um, yes, it's, uh, it's um, uh, right now, well, this piece is in the collection of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. They own it. Oh. Um, and then um, it's also um, a, a limited edition of six. So the Museum of Contemporary Photography oh. also owns one, but it's not. I don't. It, I don't make the work for for distribution. Okay. Yeah. No distribution. Oh, no. Thank you both. I currently live in Chicago, and I also have been trying to get uh, into the building. And one of the things that has always struck me as interesting is about how he acquired the building, and the fact that he posed as a janitor. When you read it in his, his memoir, he talks about acting as a janitor. I think and, the, or maybe I have it all. There's a point of confusion. Right. They commissioned the building. Okay. The building was actually purpose built. Uh, so they commissioned it. They worked with uh, John Moody. Mr. Johnson, American Art Director, Great Renown. Yes. Mr. Johnson commissioned the building. Yes. So as a misconception, you've read it. Yes. <laughs> Are there any things in there that you would have wanted to capture that you didn't get to? Um, that's very interesting. That's that's a really interesting question. I think um, there are floors that I didn't capture um, simply because they had uh, largely been abandoned. They hadn't been used for several years. Um, so there, you know, there were floors uh, that. Um, uh, and it's just because as the, you know, the business kind of matured, they didn't need as much space. I mean, you know, office technology and efficiency, but also I think there were external influences in terms of circulation and the focus of the business. Um, there, was enough, there was a lot of redundant space. And, um, uh, you know, I think that I, I effectively kind of capture, you know, the, um, the scale of the environment and kind of the natural kind of um, entropy of the space, but I didn't want to dwell on, you know, this has been abandoned and this has been, you know, whatever. Um, so um, there was a, you know, that was one kind of factor that helped me kind of decide what to photograph or, or film. Another was um, my ability to kind of find a, find a satisfying position. There was one floor in which there was a green, a green and black plaid pattern. Um, I can't remember the business that, that, that operated from that floor, but uh, it just a really compelling environment, but I could never find a satisfactory angle. Um, and then um, uh, something that kind of emerged over the course of uh, the film was the, the role, and this is a whole kind of other conversation that we could have on another occasion, but the role um, that, uh, uh, or the expression of femininity within the space and how it revealed itself. Um, that was something that, uh, you know, once I kind of realized how um, uh, dominant it was within one's experience of the space, I really kind of, you know, ran with it. Um, and then very, very late um, in, in, in the process, um, I, I was granted access to, uh, there were two locked, one locked floor and one, one locked room in the whole space. Uh, the locked room was uh, Eunice Johnson's office. Um, she had passed away, I believe, two years before I photographed, and uh, Linda was the only person who had access to it. Um, and um, she uh, offered me to, you know, access to, to photograph that room or do whatever I wanted. Um, and 
uh, I did, and it was it, it made a, it made a kind of sense. Um, and then she'd also taken me up to the eleventh floor uh, to John Johnson's office. But I think I was on very much because this is not about it, uh, being a documentary of what the space was. It's about it's a personal narrative as much as anything else. Um, and there's a, a special kind of story that I wanted to emerge. And uh, I think Eunice emerged as the protagonist, and John kind of faded into the background. So even though I had access to that 11th floor, it didn't make a kind of sense in terms of investigating that. That's, 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 that's an amazingly interesting thing about her work. Yes. Eunice. Yes, yes, her voice and how, how, how resonant it is within the environment, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. Please join us in thanking uh, Dr. Elizabeth Alexander and David Hart for this amazing conversation.